Welcome everyone to Shifting Application Security Left. We're going to kick things off in about two minutes. I'm going to give people time to row in to the webcast. And again, if you're just joining us, this is shifting application security left. We'll get started in about one minute. While we're at quiet time, I just wanted to say break a leg, Craig. Have, have a uh, do well, I'm sure you will. And thank you everybody else for making this a success. So while you're waiting to uh, start the, <laughs> while we're waiting to start the show here, um, my slides are already online at speakerdeck.com slash Craig um, If there's any one link you copy down from this presentation, I would encourage you to make it this one because this link will uh, get you all the others in the deck. Uh, so speakerdeck.com slash Craig Stunts. You can get the slides for this talk or any of my other talks, and um, that way you'll have the references that I give throughout the presentation. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone on this webcast to post to the Teams Q&A um, throughout the presentation. Um, I have a whole hour of content. There's not going to be 10 minutes of dead air at the end for questions. So um, please just post your questions to the Teams Q&A and Michael Slater will read them to me uh, during the presentation. And any questions you have that you think are generally interesting to the whole audience, um, I can uh, answer during the presentation. And for if you have something very specific to your needs that you think is maybe not so interesting for the entire audience, um, just get in touch with me on, uh, I, I'll give my email at the end, my, my Twitter address, um, and I'd be happy to talk to you in private. So I'm having a little trouble with my remote here. I'm going to just use the keyboard. Um, so I've spent a lot of effort over the years to build bridges between the developer, the QA, and the security communities. Um, sometimes this is focused on bringing groups of people together who don't normally talk to each other. Uh, other times it's on very specific techniques. When a client asked me to train their development team, uh, they asked for an OWASP training to fulfill a contractual obligation. I started to form a talk which brought together all of these elements into a unified approach to secure development. 
Um, instead of just giving an OWASP training, I wanted to go further. Could we incorporate checklists like the OWASP top 10, but look to the larger problem of how to actually build secure software? And I wanted to incorporate research and security first principles. So building secure systems is hard. Um, checklists of best practices we can follow don't necessarily result in a secure system. Is there a methodology we can follow to do it right? I'm going to lean heavily here on the information security practice principles from Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. So let's start at the beginning. How do you enter the medical professional? Um, the Hippocratic Oath, which you see a section of on the, the screen here is one of the oldest binding documents in human history. Uh, many doctors start their career with the Hippocratic Oath. How do you get started in construction? Actually, it looks pretty similar. Safety is our number one priority. How do software developers start our careers? Hmm, I kind of like the other ones better. So here's a remarkable statistic. Um, exactly zero passengers were killed in air transportation worldwide in 2017. Um, however, experts have cautioned it's unlikely this low level could be maintained for the uh, future because passenger laptops might explode. Uh, you can see where I'm going with this, right? Imagine saying to a person in 1968, that the biggest risk to 2020 airplane passengers might be the computing industry's reckless disregard for human safety. Um, a question for you. What would software development look like if human safety was always the first consideration? And seriously, I've never seen a project kick off this way. What would it look like? It's not like it's, you know, a new idea. Um, the very first principle on which the Association for Computing Machinery's updated code of ethics is based on protecting people, protecting human rights, and avoiding harm. It's easy for people in the security space to look at, say, phishing statistics and complain about human behavior. Uh, we've all heard people say, you know, software would be perfect except for those darn users. Um, Computing today is at a place similar to where we were at the start of the Industrial Revolution. We're enjoying the productivity, but we're starting to notice the smog and the factory accidents. And what is security, really? Uh, we use the word to mean different things. So let's consider what we really mean in the context of software. Uh, security and QA professionals have a lot in common. Uh, developers, QAs, security analysts, and users are all interested in the actual behavior of software. Some of this is going to be described by a specification, which might be formal or more commonly informal. QAs will investigate whether the behavior correctly conforms to the specification or fails. And a good QA will expand the specification as they work. Security analysts, on the other hand, are interested in areas where the behavior falls outside of the specification, but also where the specification is self-contradictory. So to recap, a QA asks, does the software do what it should? A security analyst might ask, does it also do anything else? And I think everyone should ask, do we even know what the software is supposed to do? So what's a humble app developer to do? Here's what we tell them. And this is actually a really dangerous list because no, idea, no item on it is a bad idea, um, but doing everything is impossible. What we'd like to do is don't blindly pull in every mitigation imaginable. Instead, we'd like to assemble a suite of components which build the design. In most domains, there are non-obvious risks to human safety, as well as areas in which traditional security rules fall flat on their face. Um, you know, sometimes we say, well, don't click on links in email, but there's someone at your company, probably uh, in HR, whose job it is to open Word documents and PDFs from random idiots on the internet. 
Um, we can't tell these people don't do their job. We have to make their job safe. You can't describe a system as secure or insecure. You can't use the word security to justify a decision. Every bad password policy follows from this myth. I want to give some examples of human harm caused by software shortcomings, which are not in the OS top 10. Um, Amazon will sell essentially anything regardless of whether it's safe. Is a spell checker security sensitive software? It is if it automatically and silently changes your prescription. Um, Michael, can you see my uh, can you see my screen right now? Yes, Greg, I can see your screen just fine. OK, very good. I, I'm having some problems on this end, but if you can see it, it's great. OK. Um, iTunes wasn't designed as a money monitoring system. It was intended to be a user hostile music player. But where money is involved, Christian criminals will find a way to repurpose it. How much of this is Apple's responsibility? You might presume that some random service you make of, is of no interest to criminals, but you might well be incorrect. Or perhaps not criminals, maybe nation state actors. Um, nation state actors harness Facebook to um, essentially uh, try to start a riot in Texas. So can we do better? Um, another thing that QA and security have in common is they're not something you can just shake onto some crappy app at the end of the development process and magically make everything all better. QA and security professionals will want to help with the initial design of an application to address problems much earlier in the development process when they're where they're easier to solve. And this is sometimes sometimes called moving application security left. All right, that sounds good, but what does it mean? Obviously, I'm not the first to ask what it means to build this in the real world. Uh, let's uh, examine some other attempts at, uh, at a security development life cycle. The notion of security as a gatekeeper comes from a process that has gates. It fits really well in this process, but it's also why people see security as a group of people who say no. It's the nature of the process and similarly with QA here. And a waterfall process like you see here is not what most teams aspire to today. So let's consider some prior art in the space of secure application development. Um, NIST 864 describes five phases, uh, initiation, development or acquisition of the software tool. Uh, the third is implementation and assessment. The fourth is operations and maintenance, and the fifth is disposal. The slide you see on the screen is from phase two, development or an acquisition. And what you don't really see on this slide is actual development. It's still quite separate and not really well described by the standard. The Cisco secure development lifecycle is more of a checklist than a process, but it's a pretty good checklist as, as they go. Um, the Microsoft secure development lifecycle is interesting. Um, one of the things that makes it most interesting is it comes with some tools like the threat modeling toolkit, the attack surface analyzer and code analysis. I'm going to be using the threat modeling toolkit pretty heavily in the second part of this presentation. And it, it's, a, it's a really neat tool um, that you'll see more of coming up. Um, with the exception of threat modeling, which you absolutely should do, the emphasis here is on technical and process control, more so than domain knowledge and secure application design, such as removing hard to use security defeat, removing hard to use security features and bad defaults. Um, although the designers of the Microsoft SDLC are adamant it works in an agile process, it's not exactly spelled out. And again, I find application design questions to be at best understated, if not ignored altogether. Um, OWASP OpenSAM is worth reviewing by any organization which creates software. It takes a very broad look at the entire 
the entire software lifecycle. It doesn't spend a ton of time on application design. It says things like maintain a list of recommended software frameworks, um, explicitly applies security principles to design. I don't want to minimize the contribution here because this model describes a much broader approach to application management than I'm covering in this talk. But when we when we ask a well when we state explicitly apply security principles to design, how you know what do we do to make that true? Almost all of these processes have problems with scaling, especially in organizations where developers might outnumber security professionals 100 to 1. They also tend to be completely incompatible with a continuous delivery model where there might be dozens of releases per day. In a continuous delivery model, it's even more important to shift security left. Otherwise, we'll just produce a mess for DFIR to clean up later on. The, the process we want is one which works with existing development processes that empowers developers to make basic security decisions on their own. It correctly uses security professionals when needed, and it can adapt to new tools for which best practices don't yet exist. There are a lot of great ideas in security today, but Many of them seem to focus on what you do after you ship your product. In 2018, Slack open sourced a web application that they developed to collect information about new projects and automatically produce checklists of security considerations for the development team. The, this tool is sort of interesting because it's an example of shifting all the way to the left. The answers to the survey are used to produce a Trello board or Jira tickets for the team. So here's an interesting book. This was just released last week. I've personally read about half of it. I'm still reading it now. Um, and it is called Building Secure and Reliable Systems, Best Practices for Designing, Implementing and Maintaining Systems. Um, it was written by a group of engineers at Google, and it describes uh, processes which do scale and do work well with continuous delivery. It's based on Google's process for developing secure and reliable applications, and some of it really applies only to Google, but it's a good book that we can all learn from. Uh, one of the principal messages of the book is that for an application to be secure, it must also be reliable and vice versa. One thing that the Slack and the Google application, the, the Slack and the Google examples make clear is that tools won't save us. We have to change process. Now we can pretty easily lay an interactive process of uh, design improvement over a standard agile process. They're actually quite compatible. Now I've just dropped a couple items here that I haven't really covered yet. So we're going to be talking about seven fundamental principles of information security. But first I want to talk about threat modeling. In order to make good security decisions, we need an accurate threat model. Some of you are probably already familiar with threat modeling, so please bear with me here. Um, I'm going to explain the basics of what threat modeling is about, um, and then we'll, we'll return to discussing the, the seven principles of secure application design. But I want to talk about what threat modeling means because it's important that everyone listening to this presentation understand it. Um, the, be the basic questions that your threat model must answer are, who's affected by your software? what do you have and what could go wrong so let's expand on all of these uh, let's start with who this includes a lot of people and not just people who click on your site um, ask yourself who are your users who are your customers we all know that users and customers are not the same thing right um, who are the members of your team who's producing the software who are your stakeholders, your partners, and who are the people in your community? 
Um, few people who build threat models for a living do this, but you have to make a list. The second list you need to make is what are you building? What do you have? Infrastructure such as servers, clients, gateways, third parties, anything that, that comprises the software system. Data, um, which might include databases, but it also includes things like cache files on client machines, um, any logs or credentials that your software system produces. Um, trust boundaries, implicit or explicit, they show who or what person or what role, what escalation controls what. And the third question, what could go wrong? Who might attack it? Um, what DBAs might fat finger or delete? What else could go wrong? For each threat, we need to make a decision. Do we terminate the threat? Do we mitigate the threat or do we accept it? So do we remove the threat from the system? Do we have a compensating control for the threat? Or is the threat something that we're just going to accept um, because we think it is not a huge issue for the system? Um, what's important here is that a security professional is part of a team whose goal it is to ship working software with business value and not an adversary to the developers. We don't want to just jump, dump a giant list of threats and walk away smugly. Instead, we want to help triage and mitigate the, the list of threats. In order to do that, we need to become very familiar with the, the problem domain. Um, some things to consider. Uh, we need to take care of people first. We need to learn from history, which we might talk to business analysts or red team members about past experience. We need to consider existential threats. In 2012, a software bug caused Knight Capital's high-speed trading system to issue millions of bad trades over 45 minutes, costing the company $440 million and effectively ending their business. Another important consideration when building a threat model is regulations from government or industry groups. Um, hopefully at this point, everybody's heard about the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in the European community. Um, but it's interesting to consider how the G GDPR interacts with software architecture. If we have an event sourcing architecture, meaning we have a stream of immutable events coming into the system, how does that notion of the stream of immutable events interact with the right to be forgotten? If we say you can go and erase your personal data, is that compatible with the notion of a stream of immutable events? Um, these are all good things to think about. But I find checklists insufficient for good design. What I'm looking for is a framework designed to make sure that we cover all the risks in depth, um, including risks that are not on any checklist and not just a bunch of unrelated things to look at. So um, I went looking for a tool which would force me and others to ask the questions that would lead to correct security decisions. And what I found are the information security practice principles from Indiana University Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. They're designed to help secure technologies and systems where best practices haven't emerged yet, like this week's JavaScript framework. It's based on seven principles. And first, I'm going to explain what the principles are and then we'll go through a worked example of application design using these principles. And just as a reminder here, um, please do feel free to ask questions using the MS Teams uh, questions facility. You can just type any questions you might have into the chat and Michael will interrupt me uh, as we go. So the first principle is comprehensivity. Am I covering all of my bases? And the comprehensivity principle states that I must identify and account for all relevant act systems, actors, and risks in the environment. Now, this is a very tall order. 
Um, but we're going to go through these list of principles multiple times since they interrelate. So we don't necessarily need to be entirely comprehensive on the first pass. If I forget a system or forget an actor, that's fine. It'll probably come up as we go through it on uh, su subsequent passes through the seven principles. The second principle is opportunity. Am I taking advantage of my environment? I need to take advantage of the actor relationships, material resources, and strategic opportunities available in the environment. For example, uh, industry groups, threat intelligence services, um, tooling like uh, continuous delivery tools, static analyzers, partnerships. The third principle is rigor. I need to specify and enforce the expected states, behaviors, and processes governing the relevant systems and actors. Rigor has two phases, specification and enforcement. Um, an interesting uh, example of this is the notion of language theoretic security, which states that I am um, in, in language theoretic security, I want to have a boundary of my system at which point I take untrusted input and turn it into trusted input um, by using by using the uh, the uh, types of a language at the borders. The fourth principle is minimization. Minimize the size, quantity, and complexity of what is to be protected and limit externally facing points of attack. Um, and th this includes not just the size of the system, but things like time. Um, so I want to remove unused data, remove unused code from the system as time moves forward. The fifth principle is compartmentalization. Totally iso so is this made of distinct parts with limited interactions? And I want to totally isolate system elements, then enable and control the interactions between those system elements that are essential for their intended purpose. We often think of this in terms of network partitioning, but network partitioning is only one example. It can be kind of leaky if you think about phishing as an attack. Um, but we can also do things like compartmentalize on identity as with Google's Beyond Corp or elevation of privilege. The sixth principle is fault tolerance. Um, what happens if this fails? We need to anticipate and address the potential compromise and failure of system elements and security controls. And the last principle is proportionality. Is it worth it? Tailor security strategies to the degree of risk, accounting for the practical constraints imposed by the use case and the environment. So these are all very interesting considerations, but they, they might seem kind of abstract. Like how do I actually apply these to a software architecture? Um, how can I decide when I'm done? So, what we're going to do here is we're going to use a running example of a real design that I did for a client uh, with some identifying details removed and some features changed to make the design more generally applicable instead of unique to that client's needs. And hopefully applying these principles to the design, uh, we'll start with a very simple example of the design and then it will get a bit more complex as we apply these principles to the design. And hopefully that, that will bring this a little bit down to earth and you'll see how applying the principles will force us to ask the questions that are going to make, make us make good security decisions. So the running example that I'm going to use here is this problem. Um, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read the description here. A hotel chain needs to capture credit card numbers for potential incidental charges where the cardholder will not be present at check-in. For example, a parent uh, might want to authorize incidental charges for a traveling school sports team member. This, the, the child will be in the hotel, uh, but the parent won't, and they need to, to give their, their credit card in advance in case there are any incidental charges on the room. 
Uh, the hotel's current process is a paper form. To their credit, they know that this is not a good solution and they'd like to automate this and come up with something that will, uh, that will protect their data. So I think it's obvious that there are some security problems here. Um, you may see some, uh, but you know, you're, you're very smart people. Um, we want to say, is, is there something that we can do that will force us to ask the questions about, about what security decisions we have to make? So where do we even begin on a problem like this? Um, there's no shame in starting with a naive solution as long as we don't end there. So we start with a simple web application. Uh, we're using HTTPS because we care about security. Uh, you might see some potential problems here, but you know, you're smart people. Uh, is there a framework that we can use for finding issues while we work with developers? Uh, let's apply the first of the seven principles, which is comprehensivity. And even looking, if I if I flip back here to our initial design, the, the truth is this is a bit oversimplified. Um, and even at the purely technical level, we've omitted quite a bit from the original diagram. So we say, well, you know, actually, uh, we're going to host this on AWS. The hotel has an internet, um, you know, so on and so forth. Um, speaking with kind of about sticking with the principle of comprehensivity, let's talk with a domain expert. Um, you might presume that the biggest risk here is the theft of credit card numbers, but the domain expert says actually they have a bigger problem, which is that the site can be used to validate stolen credit cards. Um, so we're going to add that to our diagram. And the domain expert also points out that there are some actors missing from the threat model. So it's not clear how they fit in yet, but we're going to at least add them while we're getting started. And um, the tool here that I'm using is the Microsoft Threat Modeling Toolkit. Um, and it produces these diagrams, but as I build the diagram, it's also in the background producing a list of threats that we need to analyze and account for. Um, it's really important that we remember that the comprehensivity principle requires not just identifying actors, risks, etc., but also accounting for them. And the threat modeling tool is going to help out with this via its analysis view. Um, uh, and I'm going to return to this later. Um, we're not going to account for all the threats right now because we're not required to complete the principles in order, and we want to consider all of them uh, before we start accounting for threats. But we're not done until we account for all risks. Um, in general, you should expect to consider all seven principles twice, um, but we're already off to a pretty good start. The hotel also has some existing security infrastructure including uh, static analysis and CI builds and continuous monitoring, which we'll consider in a moment, but I wanna bring it up now to emphasize the point that the principle of comprehensivity applies to time as well as space, and we should consider future interactions with the system that we build. In other words, um, components of the system that are safe right now uh, might not be safe in the future if, um, security holes are discovered in those components, uh, say, you know, one year, five years down the road. So by using a static analyzer, we can find security holes moving forward in time. Um, another uh, thing to consider under the umbrella of comprehensivity is training. Um, we need to pick the right training for our threat model and for our team. We tend to think of training in terms of like certifications and the OS top 10, but maybe the most important topic for training is your business specific assumptions and your threat model. Training takes time and we need to make sure we're training on the right things. For the opportunity principle, there are three factors to consider. The first is actor relationships. Uh, the hotel has some existing infrastructure um, and AWS. Um, then they have a tokenization service for uh, tokenizing credit cards. 
We also need to consider information sharing with others in the same line of business. There's professional organizations for this. The second factor to consider is material resources. We need to do things like follow the AWS Security Best Practices white paper and use managed services instead of maintaining bare metal. This is a good area for checklists like the OWASP Proactive Top 10. Um, lastly, there's strategic opportunities. We need to work with business users to design a process which doesn't require creating accounts and passwords. Another example of the opportunity principle is using existing secrets management infrastructure. Developers frequently leave secrets in config files and Jenkins servers, but instead they should go in enterprise secret stores with audit trails. There's obviously more I could do. Um, I'm limited in the amount of ideas I can present in a one hour talk, but you get the idea here with opportunity. Um, the next principle to examine is rigor. There's two steps to rigor, specification and enforcement. You can specify with varying degrees of formality. A sequence diagram like you see here is more formal than a plain English description and is less formal than a modeling language like TLA+. Um, with a modeling language, you can use a model checker to require the self-consistency of the specification. Um, then we need to enforce the specification, and one good place to start is your language's type system. Make, make incorrect state impossible to construct. Another good way to enforce rigor, which is practically free, is static analysis. People say, you know, if I turn this on, I have thousands of violations, so I just don't use it. Instead, what you should do is turn on your static analyzer, grandfather in all existing violations, which takes you like half an hour to do. And now you have the static analyzer checking all new code in the repo forever. Uh, you can go back and analyze the grandfather rule violations when you have time and when you can make security, when you can make decisions as to which are actually important. But just turning on the static analyzer means that from this point forward, you have the analyzer looking at all of your new code. So we've gone from this naive implementation that we started with in our payment system to this thing down on the bottom, which, I mean, it's cool. Look at all the security features in there. More is better, right? Maybe. Um, the principle of minimization applies to, in, in many ways, to our project. We need to minimize the attack surface by putting the attack surface by putting servers behind firewalls, um, blocking SSH into the private network, set maybe via jump server from known IPs. Um, we need to minimize tools. AWS in particular makes this hard because it feels like a Lego set. You want to throw more and more into your AWS uh, implementation. Um, but we need to do things like minimize user interfaces. We want to delete code, minimize everything. Uh, one good thing to consider is the data you store. A criminal can't steal data that you don't keep. So can you store less or remove old records? It's not just a good idea. It might be a compliance requirement. We need to minimize data collection. Uh, we don't want to store PII when we can avoid it. We want to active do, actively delete old data. The default of most databases is to never delete data except MongoDB. Um, next principle is compartmentalization, which has three steps. Totally isolate each element on the system enable the specific interactions needed between uh, isolated elements and control those enabled interactions. A great place to start on this is any place on our diagram, on our threat model diagram, where data flows cross trust boundaries. So there's a misconception about compartmentalization and the misconception is that there's a safe side of a perimeter, like an internal network. 
the goal of compartmentalization is to stop lateral movement, not to have a place where there are no defenses. And another misconception is that compartmentalization is only about network parameters. An example is least privilege. We want to give people and machines the minimum rights needed to do their work. Now, at first, this might seem to conflict with the principle of human-centered design, but actually, it, it's really great to protect people against mistakes. We want to give them a system that enables them to get their work done, not a system that blows up and destroys itself if we hit the wrong key. Um, what this means in practice is that you need to have a, a mechanism for emergencies that allows you, you to get around these restrictions when needed. Um, Google calls these break glass mechanisms. And, the, you know, in the so Google doesn't normally allow their site reliability engineers to SSH into a production machine, for example. Um, but with in the case of an emergency, they may need to do that. They have a break glass mechanism which allows um, site reliability engineers in certain places um, to uh, work around the security uh, infrastructure that they have built um, with heavy logging and, and similar things. But um, for emergencies, they, they can uh, work around some of the limitations that are normally in place. So here are some decisions that we might make. And again, that there are many more that we might arrive at if we drill down deeply. Um, the next principle is fault tolerance. We need to consider the principle of fault tolerance for every point in the system. I'm going to give only one example in this presentation, which is compromised credentials. But you should do an, an error analysis for every system and every entry point at the very least. I'm going to choose the example of compromised credentials because we often think of faults in terms of technical faults rather than information leakage faults, but both are actually important. So what happens if credentials are compromised? Um, the typical response is, hey, free credit monitoring. Um, but instead, we need to look at this before it happens and decide what will we do to make something right if we compromise end user data somehow? We need to stop the exfiltration. We need to look at what happened and we need to make things right for the end user. Um, having gotten this far, we now have a really extensive list of risks and we need to make sure that we spend time on appropriate issues. The Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool has features to help with this. Um, it will make a list of threats for us to examine, and then we can prioritize the threats. And the highest priority issues, uh, th these are, I mean, the, the priorities are set by us, not by the tool, and we should set the priorities highest where they directly or indirectly affect human safety. Um, security should not exist solely for the sake of security. Security is always in furtherance of some greater organizational goals. It should be crafted with those goals in mind. So we set the priority based on the effect on human safety and then on the safety of our business. And then we consider the status. Um, is the issue uh, not started yet? Does it require investigation? Have we decided that it's not applicable to our project or have we mitigated the threat? Um, because the principles interact and actually conflict in places, like um, consider the principle of comprehensivity and the principle of minimization. Those are kind of directly at odds with each other. Um, so because the principles interact and they do conflict in places, we can't just go through them once in an application design. The bare minimum is twice, but plan on more. 
And the thing that actually makes the most sense to me in the agile world is to go through them at least once per sprint. Um, so initially we have some work to do as we get started. You know, we might set up things like security control and CI, but continuously we want to, as we're grooming our backlog, uh, we want to go through these principles and they should, if we go through all seven, they should force us to ask the questions, you know, that we need to do to introduce the correct security controls into the project. And then periodically, there are things that we can't do with every delivery, like a human pen test, um, simply because it, it's too expensive and it probably doesn't produce uh, results. <laughs> um, uh, that, that it will it will produce the results that we need um, you know as the pen tests are done uh, but we don't need to be doing that every two weeks moving forward um, but anyway the, the this approach of asking these questions um, works really well in an agile process because it encourages us to keep drawing water from the well. Um, so what is omitted from this from this process? You know, what is not included in the in the seven principles? Well, the first principle of comprehensivity, um, you know, that that arguably covers a lot of things. Um, so maybe the thing to do is to say, you know, what what might we need to consider that isn't really called out directly by this principle of comprehensivity? So um, when was the first the first thing I thought of is testing. Um, when we build a security system, we need to test the security system and make sure that it works. Um, we can use things like attack simulation to make sure that our security controls work. We also need to consider the difference between um, a malicious insider or uh, a malicious third party and incompetence um, or, you know, just mistakes. Um, it, it's funny that they, they can a mistake can look a lot like a security threat, but there are differences between them that we need to account for and a reliable system um will be will protect us against mistakes as well as threats um, another thing that's not really covered by the seven principles is reaction times so we would like to um, when there is a problem either a reliability problem or a security problem we want to be able to respond to that in a very short amount of time and coupled closely with that, although it's not quite the same thing, is automation. Um, we would rather respond using automation, for example, scripts, than with a human operator going in and changing stuff. Um, but we need human supervision over the automated processes, and we need break glass escapes for emergencies that, that will allow us to uh, move beyond the automation when it is clear that that we need to do that. Um, so hey, three Greg. books I do recommend. Yes, go ahead. I do have a question from the audience here on the yes. principles. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the hardest of these principles to get developers to act upon, uh, or you know the ones developers seem to value the least? Uh, that's an interesting question here. Um, let me think about that a little bit. So what what I would say about these things is that it's not a case that developers don't want to do these things. It's that they're not top of mind. So a principle like comprehensivity is, um, you know, I, I can tell a developer you should be comprehensive in your approach to security um, and they will say yes, but then they might, you know, go and get 
into a very specific problem that requires them to use, you know, 100% of their concentration on that problem. So the problem, the problem that I have is not active resistance from developers. It's that, um, it's that I need to to go back to them again and again. And and I'm a developer myself. Like I understand this as well as anybody. Um, I need to go and I need to to actually make a practice of going through these principles and and saying, you know, what have I missed? You know, when I'm the, when I'm focused on this problem. Thank you for that. And I think I do have one additional question here is we hear DevSecOps uh, a lot these days. In an agile environment, how does security participate knowing sprints or iterations are time box to such sh a short duration? So um, actually, this is a good segue into the into the slide here on more reading. Um, traditionally, security has been a gate that um, has worked, I would say, kind of after the fact with a, with a piece of shipping software. Um, and we need a different model for that. So actually the second book here, um, Building Secure and Reliable Systems, uh, you can get this book for free online. And it really describes in a, in a very thorough and comprehensive way. Um, now, the, the, the one thing about this book is that a lot of what it describes is really only applicable to an organization um, at Google's scale. Um, however, there, there's a great deal in here that is actually generally applicable to organizations of all sizes. And I, I really do recommend this book. Um, the, the, this, it presents a different model from the traditional from the traditional notion of security as a as a gatekeeper. Um, so um, just examples from there. Um, like I said, the the the, um, the notion of um, like it, it's funny. A, a lot of the the practices at Google, you can think of that as almost like securing the security people. So um, things like don't give anyone direct access to a production system. And that, that means literally anyone, um, you know, not through SSH, not through anything. Um, so they, they use things like a, a secure proxy so instead of directly uh, working on a production server via SSH, um, they can run scripts against the, the production server. Um, and, the, you know, the, the degree of automation that they have built for their systems, it might seem to many organizations like, oh, we'll never get there. But by looking at this model that they've built of how they deal with continuous delivery and continuous security, um, I think it gives a, it gives a really, um, it gives an interesting approach that um, it is well thought out and, and, and works together as a whole. All right, I do have another so, question for you. OK, go ahead. Uh, Mike in the audience has asked, how do we show developers what's in it for them when it comes to security? So I guess I would say um, this goes back to the original point of the, the talk, which is that um, you at some fundamental level, you have to decide that you care about the safety of humans that work with your software. And to whatever degree that you do not care about that, um, you are not going to be interested in producing a secure system. 
So we need to have the entire company, which includes developers, but it also includes salespeople and QA people and, you, you know, uh, evangelists. Um, we need to start and build and deliver systems that um, fundamentally are concerned with human safety of our users. And I'm aware that this sounds ridiculous. Um, you know, if we think about, you know, the, the, uh, the control software on our toaster, um, but I think that's simply because we don't have a practice of it. Um, if construction workers and medical professionals uh, can do this, then so can we. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not as though software has no influence over safety. I gave a number of examples in the beginning of the deck of where, of how software that you might not, you know, you, you might not think that iTunes or you might not think that, uh, you know, the, the refrigerator is going to have that much of an impact on safety, but in fact, they do. Um, and making this a consideration, a, a principal consideration of the designs that we build, I, I just don't think there's any substitute for that. All right, and I did get a few questions flooding in, so um, we won't get to them okay. all, but I think the next one that might be great to ask is, uh, where did it go here? <clears throat> is there a recommended mechanism to measure or know how successful an organization is at applying security principles, um, other than the fact that it might be 120 days since the last hack counter? <laughs> um, yeah, so there, there, there are a num so, there are mechanisms that, uh, like one that I especially like is attack simulation, um, which are, um, you know, it, it's software that you can that you can go out and use to run attacks on your own infrastructure and um, see, you know, how well those are handled. Uh, another good example are canaries that, um, are, you know, will, will um, be irresistible to attackers in your system and, and let people know uh, when they come up. So the, the question to my mind is not so much is there are there ways to know it's that is there a way to know it, you know is there one way that that really um, will cover everything. And I don't think that we're at a we're at that point as an industry yet. I don't think there's a single solution to that. I think that, that we have to sort of decide what's important to us as part of our threat model. And then from the threat model, we can say, OK, we can we can pick these these tools um, and, and these practices that will that will help us uh, dis decide where we are as an organization. Thank you. And uh, the next question is uh, back to the topographical analysis. Uh, what extent should we account for the possibility of negative actors within the organization? Um, I think that a negative uh, you know a, a malicious actor in the organization for a large enough organization is the rule not the exception it is just a a part of life um it's unfortunate but it's true um and this is why i don't like i, I don't put a lot of stock in the notion of a, a, an internal network you know uh you know the the notion of well, on, on this side of the, the firewall, you know, it's a free for all. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that, that is just, a, um, it's just another bad actor in, in, in that way. 
Thank you, Craig. And I think we're nearing the end of our time slot. So if you could go and close out and hopefully these people can follow up with more of their questions on Twitter or another platform with you. Sure. Um, real quick, uh, I want to um, just say uh, that we have a couple of presentations coming up next week. There's Team Leadership for Beginners by Tim Rayburn and Remote Scrum Mastery How uh, by Ty Crockett. And if anybody would like to contact me and ask questions that you were not able to ask during the chat, um, please uh, use one of these methods, uh, Twitter, Craig Stunts, or Craig.Stunts at Improving.com. And I would be happy to, to chat with you. Um, also, I can give this talk or any of my other presentations to uh, your team. It's not an ad. I, I don't charge money for this. Um, I just want to build a community which uh, creates better security practices. All right, thank you, Craig, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, spending some of your time with me today.